All right, so I had some questions during the break of in those pre-flop situations, I sort of covered how picky you need to be about your hand when you have about 40 big blinds um, and how picky you need to be about your hand when you have about 25 big blinds. Um, people asked me why I didn't really cover the case where we only have 10 or 15 big blinds. You know, can we go in with bottom pair if we only had 10 big blinds to start the hand? Um, I didn't really cover those situations. They are sometimes relevant, but for the most part, you're often going to be all in preflop when you only started with less than 15 big blinds preflop, right? So a sort of rule of thumb I gave was usually if you're going to play the hand, just go all in preflop if you have less than 15 big blinds and the antis are out. So there are definitely situations in practice when you don't actually want to get all in preflop with 15 big blinds, but um, they're rare enough that I'm going to skip them for now. And similarly, you know, let's say we had 200 big blinds or 100 big blinds, you know, you're going to obviously have to be pickier than if you only had 40 big blinds. But um, the principles I gave for 40 big blinds are decent and pretty applicable to having more big blinds. Because even though you might not put all the money in, you can often still, you know, even if you have only two pair, and you have 200 big blinds, even though you might not be prepared to put all 200 big blinds in when you check raise with your two pair, check raising just to make the pot bigger when you have a good hand is usually still a good play. Okay, good. So, all right, so let's get to part two. So I wanna first start by looking at a preflop scenario to illustrate a point. So. Let's suppose the hijack raises to 2400 and he's a big stack and we're dealt the worst possible hand or arguably the worst possible hand in poker, 2-7 offsuit in the big blind. And we only started the hand with three big blinds and we already put one of those into the pot. So now, do we call? So we have to do the math in this situation, right? So we know we're going to be all in, so we can just do the equity calculation and it'll answer our question exactly of whether we should be calling. So we need to call two big blinds to win 5.5 .5 big blinds already in the pot. Three from him, one from us, one from the antes, and half from the small blind. So the equity we need is two divided by 7.5 or 27% equity needed. So let's assume he's raising the top 25% of hands which is these yellow hands shown down here, which is approximately a decent estimate. So depending on your opponent, if he's extremely tight, obviously you would make, make his range smaller, and if he's extremely loose, you would make it bigger. But for an average person from the hijack, um, or for someone who's following the guidelines for preflop hand selection that I gave in lecture one, um, this is about a reasonable assumption. So. Our equity with 7-2 offsuit is 28%, which is greater than 27%. So basically, it's high enough that we should call. Okay, so as a general rule of thumb, if you only have three big blinds and you put in one of them as the big blind, you can basically always call. Um, you know, even if you, even if you started with four big blinds um, and you posted the big blind, so you only have three left, you, usually you can pretty much call. You should only be folding the worst hands like 2-7 offsuit, but you know, like queen-7 offsuit, you can definitely be calling, um, even like an under-the-gun raise pretty much. Okay, so now let's look at the same situation, except for we're going to have 2-7 offsuit again, but we're going to have 60,000 chips instead of just 2,400 chips. Okay, now do we call? So we know by the equity calculation, it's a positive EV call, right? But this obviously seems like a terrible call to anyone who's played poker before. Why would you call with the worst hand? Because we have enough preflop equity. So this is where I want to introduce reverse implied odds. In the first situation, we called because we were all in, and the equity calculation, which basically assumes that players are all in, right? The equity calculation assumes that no player is going to fold and all five cards are going to come. Then we said that we could call with 5.5 .5 to 2 odds. But in this situation, even though the pot odds tell us to call, the correct play is to fold. The reason is because the hand is not over when we call. We still have to play the flop, the turn, and the river. With a hand like 7-2 offsuit, it's going to be difficult to play well post-flop. We're often going to fold the best hand. If we pair our deuces and there's four higher cards on the board, it's easy for him to buff us off our pair of deuces. 
and you know often we'll we'll call him he'll have a higher pair so we're just going to make lots of bad decisions it's not like we can make a straight or a flush and get him to call with the worst hand so we fold even though we have the direct odds to call because of what we call reply reverse implied odds let's look at a similar situation let's say we had ace two offsuit which is a pretty good hand equity wise we actually we actually have 43 percent equity against his range and we only need 27 percent but i would still fold even though we have way more equity than we need against his range and once again it's because reverse implied odds are just too relevant we still have up to 46,000 chips to play for post flop and even if i'm getting it in good pre-flop i will often lose a lot of money when he has a stronger ace and an ace comes i'll often get bluffed off a pair of deuces and once again we're out of position the entire hand we have to act first on the flop the turn and the river which causes us to make even more mistakes Now let's suppose we had 9-8 suited. Our equity went down from 43% to 37%, but I would call in this situation. Because here, the reverse implied odds don't really work against us. Okay, our equity is worse, but now we can hit a straight and get him to call with the worst hand. Or we can hit a flush and get him to call with the worst hand. Or we can hit a straight draw, um, miss maybe but have a good card to bluff and get him to fold the better hand and when we pair a nine or an eight it's less likely that we're dominated and also harder to bluff us off because there will be fewer cards higher than a nine and an eight on the board we're still out of position so the it's still not a great situation but overall it's way better than the situation with ace two offsuit even though ace two offsuit had more equity okay so now let's talk about implied odds. Let's look at a hand where implied odds come into play. They're sort of the opposite of reverse implied odds. There are situations where we don't have the equity to call, but we call anyway, not because we like to gamble, but because we think that we can make better decisions than our opponent on future streets because of our position or because of our hand. So one good example is set mining. Let's say the under the gun raises and we have a pair of deuces on the button. Against his range, if he's any kind of tight player, like we suggested, we're basically crushed. So if we look at our equity against his range, assuming it's the suggested range of pocket eights plus and etc., we only have 34% equity. And, you know, the odds say we need 35% equity, which is, so we don't quite have enough. I guess we're not that far off. I mean, we didn't factor in the fact that the small blind or the big blind could re-raise or pick up an even better hand. But um, anyways, the point is I would definitely call, even though equity might not say so. Because we're in position, and basically, when we hit a third deuce, we, can, we, hit, we hit a monster hand. And it's also hard for him to put us on the hand, right? When a deuce comes on the flop, our opponent is going to look at it as a harmless card for the most part. So basically, we can when we hit that deuce we can get a ton of money from our opponent post flop against aces we can win a ton of money on a seven five deuce flop we can win a huge pot against ace king on an ace six deuce flop so note that probability says we're only going to hit a two one eighth of the time that's pretty rare it's rare because we already have two twos in our hand so the third one there's only two twos left in the deck that could potentially come so we're going to lose the pot most of the time when we call but the point is, look at all the chips there are to play for post-flop. We have 80,000 chips to put in post-flop. So we're going to lose the pot about 7 eighths of the time. But we're going to win a huge pot when we do hit a set. A set is basically three twos. So in this case, we say that we're set mining. So note that you need a lot of chips. You basically need the effective stack size to be at least 50 big blinds for set mining to be a good play. Even if we only have 30 big blinds, let's say we only had 24,000 chips here. Set mining is basically sketchy, and I wouldn't do it. Even with 50, I think it's kind of sketchy. I think you need more than 50 to do it, especially against a decent opponent who is capable of making some reasonably big folds. Okay, let's take a look at another hand where implied odds come into play. 
The cutoff raises, we call in the button with Jack-10 suited, which is a hand that has lots of good implied odds post-flop, and also um, we're in position, which is great. Um, but we're going to look at a case where implied odds even come more into play later. So we flop a flush draw and our opponent continuation bets. We could raise, but then if he ra re-raises all in, then we have to fold our draw. So I think calling is a better play. And also we're in position. So if we call and we want to try to bluff him off later, we, we, still, we, can, we can still bluff the turn if he checks the turn or bluff the river if he checks the river. And so there's no need to try to raise and get him to fold now. If we were out of position, I think raising to try to get him to fold now would relatively be a better play. But in both cases, I would still call. Now, he bets big on the turn. Okay, so now we need to analyze our situation. Let's assume that, let's assume that when he does this, he's got a pretty good hand. We're not going to win by rivering a jack or a 10. We need to river a diamond. We need to call 8,000 to win 20,000 already in the pot. So the equity we need is 29%. But if we look at our chances of winning, it's 9, the 9 diamonds left, out of 46. So the equity we have is only 20%, which is not enough. However, I would definitely still call in this situation. Because when we hit our flush, we actually win, we win more than 20,000. We win 20,000 plus the money that we get to put in on the river. So even though we don't have the equity to call, I want to call because of implied odds. So let's look at the same scenario with different cards. Here we still have a diamond flush drop, but there's three diamonds on the flop. Sorry, there's three diamonds on the board, and we have the jack of diamonds in our hand. Okay, in this situation, I would definitely fold. In the first situation, our flush was a lot more disguised. When a third diamond came on the table, it was a lot more likely that he would call us with his ace-king or whatever, not necessarily believing that we have the flush. So we can bet big on the river and expect a lot more calls when we hit our flush. And furthermore, a big factor here is when we hit our flush, we have a great hand. Sure, we can still lose to a higher flush, or you know, the river could be the nine of diamonds and he could have a full house. But it's pretty hard to beat us when we hit our flush. He needs to have the king of diamonds with another diamond or a full house, or the queen of diamonds with another diamond. Whereas in this situation where we have the jack of diamonds only, even if a diamond comes, we still get beaten by the naked queen of diamonds, right? Or the naked king of diamonds. So imagine if he had ace-king with the king of diamonds, then we're drawing dead. And furthermore, the, the board is already paired. If he already has a full house, we're drawing dead. So our, imp our implied odds are way worse, not only because we're less likely to get paid off when we hit, but also because sometimes we'll hit and we'll have the second best hand and we'll actually have reverse implied odds because we're going to put in more money on the river with the worst hand. So it's a terrible situation. So I would definitely just fold our hand here. Okay, so in the last hand, we saw where we had, um, we saw where we had a flush draw and we basically played it what I would say passively. We basically called, 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 and our plan was to only bet later if we hit our f draw and just fold if we missed. But in poker, draws are actually some of the best hands to bluff with. So I mentioned this earlier, you shouldn't be bluffing with absolutely nothing. You don't want to bluff with 2-7 when the flop is ace-king-queen. You don't want to be bluffing because you had some kind of draw. So let's take a look at an example. The button raises to 1600 and we call in the big blind with 10-9 offsuit. We flop a good straight draw, an open-ended straight draw, or an 8-out straight draw. And we check to the button, which is customary. We let him continuation bet. And then we go all in. So this, at first glance, might seem kind of crazy. Why don't we have a good draw? Why don't we just call and we have our great implied odds? We'll just call and put the money in when we hit and not risk our whole stack when we miss. Why don't we just do that? The thing is, we have, the thing is our hand loses to a lot of garbage hands in his range, right? We lose even if he has a crap hand like queen seven because he's got queen high and we have 10 high. So by check raising all in with our draw, 
we get him to fold a lot of his mediocre hands. The thing is, even though we only have 10 high, and it looks risky to be risking our, all our chips, the thing that matters isn't that we have 10 high. The thing that matters is how many outs we have when he calls with the better hand. I would much rather have 10-9 here than King Deuce, because when he calls, we have 8 outs. Even if he has the best possible hand, pocket jacks, we have 8 outs when he calls. Compare this to having, say, something 6-5. You might feel a lot safer by check-raising all-in with 6-5 six, six, on this flop, but I wouldn't, because even though you have a pair of fives, he's only going to call you with a hand that basically beats a pair of fives, and you only have five outs to hit two pair or better when you have 6-5, and you have almost no outs if he has pocket jacks. So I'd much rather check-raise bluff with our draw than with a hand like 6-5. So the important thing here isn't that we check raised all in with 10 high, it's that we check raised all in with a hand with 8 outs, which is a very healthy number of outs. So this is sort of the bluffing epiphany number one. It doesn't matter how good our hand is, it only matters how many outs we have against the hands he calls our raise with. That's why bluffing with draws is so good, because draws are hands that suck because they're 10 high against all his shitty hands, but against all his good hands, which are the hands he's calling our raise with, oops, sorry, the draws do relatively well. Right? Compare that with a hand like 7-7. Seven, 7-7 seven. Seven, seven does well against the average hands in his range, against all his crap hands, pocket 7s, is a good hand on this flop, but we're drawing to two outs against any hand that calls our raise, so with pocket 7s it would be foolish to, to check raise on this flop because we're, only, we're just going to get him to fold everything and get him to call when we're drawing to two outs. So it's much better to just call with pocket sevens on this flop. So next time you want to make a bluff, instead of count thinking how good is my hand or how shitty is my hand, you don't want to be bluffing with a good hand or a hand with absolutely nothing. You want to be bluffing with a hand with outs against his good hands. So you want to be bluffing with draws. And you want to be counting how many outs do I have against his hands, not do I feel like he's going to fold, do I feel like my hand might win, or, okay, so, good. Um, so yeah, so this is an example of the type of bluff that I occasionally see people make online in our league, and it's just terrible. So the cutoff raises, we call with 7-6 of diamonds. We hit absolutely nothing on the flop. We decide to check raise because we think we can make him fold. He calls. The turn, we get nothing. We just bet big. He calls. The river is nothing, and we just go all in as a last resort. Right? This is not bluffing. This is just opening your wallet and giving your money to your opponent. Bluffing, as I said over and over again, is starting out with a draw and continuing betting because your draw improved or because scary cards came where you can make your opponent fold. And in this case, the three of clubs wasn't really the scariest river card. So in general, bluffing on an ace high flop is a lot harder than bluffing on a jack high flop. Because on an ace high flop, your opponent will just call you with an ace and they won't be that scared of future cards to come. Whereas on a jack high flop, if they initially called you with a jack, an ace can come later and you can bluff and represent the ace. So let's look at a hand, let's look at an example where bluffing is good. Okay, we call with 10 9 of hearts. It's the same flop, but now we have a flush draw. So we're going to check raise for the reasons outlined earlier. We want him to fold his crap. And if he does call our check raise, we do have a chance to beat him and get a lot of money. So he calls. We turn a, a 15 out draw. So this is called a big draw. Um, it's called a straight flush draw. So we have a straight draw and a flush draw, a 9-out flush draw and an 8-out straight draw. But that's not 17 outs, it's only 15 outs because we counted the 7 of hearts and the queen of hearts twice. So we bet big, he calls. Just a note here, if he went all in on the turn, we would have 15 outs and 46 cards and just barely enough odds to call his all in. And yeah, so... So notice that not only are we bluffing with our draw, we're giving ourselves a chance to put all the money in on the river if we do hit our draw. 
right? So this is why playing draws aggressively is good. Not only because you get a lot of folds, but you also give your chance yourself a chance to hit, get a huge double up when you hit. And it also is good because you usually play your good hands, say pocket deuces on this flop. You play your good hands in a similar way, and it disguises your good hands because then when you check raise, your opponent might think he doesn't necessarily always just have a really good hand. He could have a draw. Okay, now the river is the king of clubs. Um, I mean, it's still not that scary, but it's slightly scarier than the three of clubs just because, you know, we're more likely to river a two pair or like, you know, for some reason we could have queen ten of hearts or something. Um, so we go all in here and... I don't think it's a great river to bluff. I think, you know, if you wanted to just check and give up the bluff, that's okay too. We'll talk about giving up bluffs later in a later hand. But this is a much better bluff than the last hand. Okay. Um, now let's talk about giving up a bluff. So we have jack nine of hearts. We call in the big blind. Three-way hand. We flop a four out straight draw, which is a lot worse than an 8 out, eight out one, but often still good enough to bluff with. And we have an overcard jack, and we have a backdoor heart flush draw. So we check. We check, and notice that the preflop raiser checks, right? The preflop raiser did not continuation bet. The preflop raiser was hijack minus one. But cutoff bets. Okay, and here we, ch we check raise him. You know, his bet could easily be weak, because he could be like, oh, both players checked to me. The preflop raiser didn't even continuation bet. So he's probably just has nothing. So I'll just bet and try to take down the pot. So check raising here I think is a great play. Because not only because his bet is weak, but because also our hand is very potent. And could potentially hit a lot of turns where we could continue our bluff or hit a good hand. <clears throat> um, yeah, so we have four outs, eights to hit the nuts. Three outs to hit a pair higher than the 10. Three outs to hit a 9, which is a pair lower than the 10. And we have a ton of backdoor draws. If we turn a heart, we get a flush draw. If we turn a queen or a king, we get a straight draw. So notice that a king also gives us a really good straight draw because we have 7, 9, 10, jack, king. So an 8 or a queen gives us a straight. This is called a double gut shot instead of an open-ended straight draw. But both are an 8-out straight draw. And the best part of this is we can hit combinations of these cards and give us a monster draw. Like, let's say the turn is the queen of hearts. Then we suddenly have a 15 out draw. And this is what makes backdoor draws so relevant. They allow you to turn cards that give you combination draws, which are the most powerful hands that you can make a bluff with. So, um, hijack minus one folds and cut off calls. The turn is a seven of clubs, which unfortunately, all our hypothesizing about all these beautiful draws forming kind of kills everything. Um, so in this situation, I would just give up the bluff. So this card does not help us at all. Furthermore, this card is very safe. It doesn't really put his pair of tens or his pair of queens or whatever that he called our flop bet with in jeopardy. And even worse, if he decided to call our flop bet with a seven, he just improved with three of a kind. But the biggest problem with this turn card is it's now hard for us to represent a really good hand. We can't really have a 7, because with a 7, we just call the flop for the most part by the principle of call medium hands, raise strong hands, and draws fold everything else. He wouldn't expect us to check raise a 7 on the flop. He would expect us to just call with a 7 on the flop, because on the flop, we would think with a 7, if we check raised, he's just going to call better hands and fold worse hands, so we would just call. So it's really hard for us to represent a seven. So for these threefold factors, I would just give up our bluff. When you make a bluff, you don't always have to continue the whole way. You don't have to just bet big, bet big until you lose all your chips. It's often fine to check raise once as a bluff and then give it up. And yeah, for these three reasons, the fact that the, the seven didn't help us, the seven is safe, and we can't really have three sevens, I would just check and fold. And that's what we do. We check, he bets half pot, and we give it up. So yes, yeah, so that was bluffing epiphany number two. Other than counting how many outs we have, it's important to realize when we're bluffing what we're representing. If we can't really represent any good hands, then our opponent can just easily call us down 
and um, and we're going to get caught on our bluff. So an ace turn would have been a good card to bluff because just an ace is just scary in general and we could represent an ace. Um, a six would be a decent card to bluff too, I think, um, because we could represent nine, eight. We could represent a straight draw that got there. And, you know, any card from any card higher than a 10 is a decent card to bluff. A king, like I said, gives us a double gutter. A queen gives us an open ended straight draw. Um, so both of those would be good cards to bluff. A jack would make it unnecessary to bluff because we would have a good enough hand to win the hand without bluffing and not a good enough hand to bet and hope he calls with the worst hand. So, so yeah, so another corollary of bluffing epiphany number two is. It's good to bluff with a draw when a different draw completes. If you're going for a flush and the straight gets there, it's usually good for you to bluff. If you're going for a straight and the flush gets there, it's also good for you to bluff. And that's why I said the six is a good card to bluff. We were going for a straight and a different straight got there. So we can easily represent the other straight. Okay, so that's it. Um, so yeah, so what do we talk about? Um, so I guess that's summarized on this slide. Um, okay, so in the actual lecture, I think I had about 10 minutes left too. And um, I answered a question about, you know, a lot of people ask me, I gave all these ra opening ranges and I gave all these suggestions of how to play. But they're saying, look, if you're only playing against people in the class and everyone and you follow these rules, everyone knows you're following these rules. Everyone knows your strategy. They'll know how to play perfectly against you. Won't you be screwed? Um, and then they're like, so that's a good reason to not follow your rules so that we can be unpredictable and trick other members in the class. So that's true to some extent, but for the most part, the rules I'm giving you and the rule of thumbs I'm giving you are basically, um, you know, are basically rules that keep you out of trouble for the most part. And, you know, sure, if someone is a very high level poker player, you're probably better off deviating from these rules to try to trick them. But um, against most, I'm assuming most people in this class are, they're only taking it because they're a beginner. And for the most part, the people who think they're clever and deviate from these rules and think they're exploiting everyone else are actually just slapping themselves in the face. And the things that they're, the ways in which they're deviating are just going to be bad. Um, you know, you need to be really experienced to be able to deviate in a way that actually exploits the other people. And it's really easy to overestimate yourself in poker and overestimate um, how much your deviation is doing. So, you know, unless you're an expert, I mean, if you're if you're a professional poker player, you shouldn't be taking this course. This is a course for beginners. Um, so that's why I recommend everyone just follow the rules, because um, if you don't, chances are you're just going to be losing. You're going to be on the losing end instead of the winning end. And also. If the word Nash equilibrium means anything to you, for the most part, um, all the plays I'm suggesting are balanced in the sense that, you know, it's not like I'm, I'm suggesting you to always bluff in some spot. Every time I tell you to bluff, I'm also telling you to bet for value with other hands. So the, the strategies I'm suggesting are in some sense a Nash equilibrium. Um, they're balanced in the sense that when I tell you to bluff, I also tell you to value bet in that spot with other hands. So even if they know your strategy, they, they still can't tell whether you're bluffing or value betting because in every spot you're bluffing sometimes and value betting sometimes. And with the preflop ranges, you know, I, I'm telling you, say, from under the gun to raise pocket eights and ace king. So when the flop comes high cards, they can't just raise and know you'll fold because you could have ace king. And when the flop comes low cards, um, they can't just raise and expect you to fold ace king because you could have pocket eights. So for the most part, you know, these are the strategies that the professional poker community has converged upon after years of empirical analysis and experimentation. Okay, so that's it. Thanks for watching, guys. Bye.